Welcome everybody to a new week of discrete math, the most discrete of all maths. Uh, there is a new combinatorics CE up. As I said, through the semester we'll be doing competence exams on a somewhat occasional basis. By the end of the semester, uh, you, you, you'll have up to four takes on each one of them. So um, let's look at the quiz from last time. Looks like almost everybody got this right. What do we drop breadcrumbs on the ground as we do a recursive solution to a maze? Well, so if we ever come back to the same place we were before, we're like, oh, breadcrumb. Been there before. And then back off. If you don't do that, uh, then uh, you will infinitely loop. Uh, this doesn't help us with the process and two process lists. Um, it just helps us not run in a circle around a maze. So there you go. That's one question. Easy. Uh, there is an extra credit, like I said, for this Thursday. If you implement a 3D version of a maze, uh, the details are on Canvas. Uh, it will make up your grade because a lot of you didn't do Markov or only did part of it. So... Um, Take the uh, take the maze solver that I made last Thursday, and uh, make it 3D. You should be able to figure out how just by following the pattern. Okay. Any questions about that? Next credit. You have two days to do it. Nope. All right. Let's talk about merge sort. Then you guys here? Can you guys hear me? All right. So. Um, I've got a variety of different implementations of, of merge sort. Um, the one I use for grading, uh, I just call sort, <laughs> just to, just to make sure that uh, you know my my code isn't buggy. But my uh, my best version is this one. Uh, for, before I show that off, anyone want to show off their uh, anyone want to show off their implementation of merge sort? You don't have a good running time. So 0.5 seconds. Let's see if we can do a little bit better than that. G plus plus dash three minus CC. Nope, it's already on that. So the uh, the standard library runs in 0.5 seconds. Um, your rotation's pretty solid. You're well above 0.5 seconds. Five seconds is pretty bad. 0.5 seconds, yeah. That's this is quick sort, not merge sort. So don't don't feel too bad about it. Um, let me see what happened if I use one of my other implementations. Main four stroke implementation. Uh, yeah. Input tester. Oh, this one's broken. Okay. Yeah. What happened was the comp I, I I had some um, I had some uh, undefined behavior in my in my code, and when the compiler updated, it actually uh, broke my implementation. Even though it was correct before, uh, don't rely on a UB because even even if I compile the code with um, an older C plus plus standard. Uh, it still doesn't work. It's actually the compiler itself that changed. So I'd have to use an older version of G++ to get it to work with the old version. Um, used it 0.004 seconds. Okay. Uh, what what's uh, what's what number are you? Four seconds. Two point seven seconds. All right, that's fair. So let's take a look at current days. I guess. The S isn't seconds. Uh, that's system time. This is the amount of time spent in the user space. This is the amount of time spent in system space. So no, that is not zero seconds. <laughs> that is uh, half a second. This is this is the total running time. Right there. That's wall clock, which is like, it should be the sum of these two, but it's oftentimes not if other people are using the server. A wall clock time means you look at the clock on the wall 
and you're like, all right, begin the program. And then when it finishes five minutes later, all right, it was five minutes. But wall clock time doesn't translate into CPU time. Why? Because sometimes the CPU is busy. If other people are using the CPU, let's say there's 100 people on the server, then you're only given a hundredth of the CPU. And so your wall clock time will be 100 times your actual CPU usage. So uh, these two numbers here are actually a little bit more uh, useful as far as benchmarking go, and they're less susceptible to different um, random factors, like somebody decides to update the system or something, everything slows down, and your wall clock time explodes as a result of it. Okay, right. uh, so let's see what current is. Become current. Uh, let's see what Point six. Yeah, okay. All right. Ooh, look at that minified code right there. That's not bad. Not bad at all. All right. Score. Uh, two semicolons. Five hundred uh, character count. Yeah. So pretty close to to my implementation, which uh, was zero semicolons and four hundred something characters. Um, yeah. Let's take a look at it. So main.cc. <laughs> Very clever. So he uses dot, 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 uh, which you can do to indicate um, an unbounded number of parameters. So he is simply ignoring, uh, he's ignoring the begin and the end here. Uh, let's, um, let's reformat this code. <laughs> Sorry, it's gonna, it's gonna explode your count by 130. <laughs> it's all right. We, 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 this is being recorded. We have, we have you on the record at 507, which is pretty good. Okay. So, uh, you're creating a vector of unsigned integers, by the way, you could probably, instead of that, use, uh, unsigned int 32 type. <clears throat> yeah. So that'll, I'll save you eight characters. All right, so you're making a vector called Q, begin, begin. Uh, okay, uh, it's the first half. So you're making a vector holding the first half of V and a vector holding the second half of V. Let me minimize my face for a second here. Uh, yeah, so P and Q, although it's, I find it kind of odd that P is the second half and Q is the first half, I would, probably do it alphabetically yeah the other way um you gotta mind your p's and q's man um okay so if v size is greater than one okay so the base condition is quite clever he says if uh the size of the array is zero or one do nothing do you see that so his base condition is actually not the if statement, it's the antithesis of the if statement. So if the size is zero or one, it just returns because you can do that. Oh. Uh, all right. So if merge sort Q front back one, uh, all right. so you are going to sort the, uh, First half and the second half. Um, I don't think you actually need any of this because you're not doing anything with these parameters here. I think you could probably delete all of that and delete all that as well. Um, so if so, you noticed how we used if to get rid of a semicolon. So if merge sort and then do nothing. And so the, uh, the merge sort, you normally can't put into an if statement because it's a void function, right? You can't say if void function because void functions don't return a value. So he is using the comma operator. The comma operator here is um, going to uh, hide the fact this is a void function and just put true there. It doesn't matter if you put true or false because it doesn't have anything there. And so by doing this, um, 
he is able to put merge sort into an if statement and eliminate a semicolon that way. Auto L, uh, which I don't like using as a variable name because it looks like a one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so auto L equals Q dot begin, R equals P dot begin. So you're making two characters, L and R. L corresponds to the left one, R corresponds to the right one. Okay, that's, that's acceptable. Uh, so that is an iterator pointing to the first part of Q, an iterator pointing to the first part of P. Okay. So if V dot clear, interesting. If V dot clear, true. Okay, so... Um, you're clearing the vector. I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. Interesting. You're wiping out V and that is our original vector. And we've got copies of all the elements in P and Q, so that should be fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, while L, which again I don't like, letter L, while L is not equal to the end and R is not equal to the end, aha, so we got a zipper merge going on here. So basically, um, looks like this. So while, uh, basically start with our pointers at the beginning of each of the half, the, the, the sorted half arrays, uh, which he does here, but he uses a semicolon to do so. So, ouch. Couldn't, couldn't figure out how to declare a variable, huh? In a, uh, yeah, so that's that's one of his semicolons there. I'm trying to figure out how to declare a variable. Yeah, C plus uh, plus seventeen and above, or maybe it's twenty and above, allows you to declare a, a variable in an if statement, but you still have to have a semicolon in it. Trust me, I I tried that approach too. I tried that approach too. Um, so the way that you can declare your variable is by actually sticking it up here in the uh, function. Uh, definition. That's the only other way you can you can make variables. Is anything passed to a function is a variable declared in that scope. So, yeah, um, yeah, it's doable. Um, you tried it. You tried it. Yeah. I'll I'll show you how I did it. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. So then we've got pointer at the beginning, point to the beginning, and then we're gonna go until the end. If the value of L is less than the value of R. Then you add L uh, to the final vector and increment it by one. And again, he's using if statements to, with a comma operator to not use a semicolon. Mm -hmm. Else uh, push the, yeah. So the left, if the left one's smaller, you copy the value from the left half into the final uh, vector and move the pointer up by one, or you do the same for the right. And then once you hit the end on one of those, then you just copy all the rest in the remaining. So while there's still stuff left to copy out of the left array, uh, just copy it over and increment. While there's stuff left in the right array, copy it over and increment. So that's a perfectly valid implementation of zipper merge. And uh, that's that's merge sort. So, uh, all right, so let me show you uh, how I did it. Show you the non minified version. So I just added extra parameters to the, uh, the thing. So main itself, you can't modify, right? So I just left this alone and then just put extra parameters up here into um, the parameter list and uh, got my extra variables that way. No semicolon needed for those. Now I used a pointer instead of an iterator. Um, and yeah, so the base case, so my, I, I did the same thing he did. So my base case is nothing. There's literally no code for the base case. It just returns, right? I didn't have to write return like Rent did. It just returns. So if the end is minus the start is greater than or equal to one. So if there's work to be done splitting wise, um, 
then watch this. So if this is false, do you guys know how short circuit evaluation works? Are you, are you familiar with the uh, concept of short circuit evaluation? I should probably talk about that then. Um, So, um, anytime you work with a pointer, what, what's the first thing you need to do? And this goes for iterators too, for that matter. What's the first thing you, iterators, by the way, don't, don't usually point at null pointer. Like they don't point out null pointer. They point at vector dot end or whatever. Check to see if it's null, right? And so we want to do something like this, like say, if it's not null, then if the string equals hello world then you know, see out uh, something, yeah. Right, uh, double equals does not work as we're using uh, C style strings. We have to use str com. Uh, so if str comp str comp returns zero. So you don't want to you don't want to do um, this comparison if string is null, right? I don't know if str comp actually will. Man, str comp. You're supposed to use string comp usually most of the time, but in this case, it's fine. Uh, and look how What if they are null? What if they're null? What if they're null? Uh, it doesn't say, right? So. Um, I don't, I don't use C strings very often. Uh, da, 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 da. What if they are null? Behavior is undefined. So it's UB if you pass in a null pointer. Okay. So yeah. So this is the kind of thing that we would do. Like, uh, if you're if you're given some sort of const char star, uh, you check to see if it's null first, right? And so if it's not null, if stir is not null, then we can do the stir comp with um, stir and hello world, and I should probably use stir and comp and compare at most. Um, Both characters. So, right. so, do you guys understand what we're doing here? Like, a str, str comp uh, is how you compare two strings using the C string library, which is absolute garbage. Um, after having used C style strings, it baffles me why anybody would use C style strings like, like we have here, but nonetheless, a lot of people still do for some reason. I don't know why. But do you, under, do you understand? Like we're checking to see if it's null so that we could do this. Like, does that make sense? Like we're doing a null check and then, then if it's not null, okay. All right. So this does the same thing. Now you might be like, but wait. Is it worth to invest time learning old C style programming? Um, depends. Do you want to get a job at a company that does C style programming? 
if that's on your possible, you know, list of places you'd want to work, then sure, learn it. Um, I personally avoid writing C style strings like the plague because there's absolutely no benefit to doing so. C++ strings are just better. Um, there's arguably probably some performance benefit, maybe, but C style strings don't carry their own size information. The only way you know how big a C style string is, is by iterating across it and until you find a null character at the end of it, which is an order in operation to tell how big a string is when it should be order one. So it, it eats up an extra, you know, eight bytes of memory, but takes an order in operation down to a very common order in operation down to an order one operation. I think the C, the C style string implementation is just worse, honestly. Okay. So, but, you know, uh, in town, there's a company called DPS Telecom. DPS Telecom does C, they, you know, they uh, are very much on C questions and this kind of stuff would come up. Okay. Sounds obsolete. Yeah. Unless you want a job here in town at DPS Telecom. Like, you know, it's like there's companies that like C is as popular, if not more popular than C++ for some reason. So... Yeah, you could say it's obsolete, but a lot of companies still do it. So, okay. So, now, do you think this code will crash, or is this code cool? If a stir was null, what do you think? It will not crash. The reason for this is there's uh, something in C++ has it's called short circuit evaluation. Uh, if you have, if X ended with Y, if X is false, it does not bother with Y. All right, those of you that, uh, paid attention during the logic section of this class. If X is false, what is false ended with anything? False. Yeah. So it does not need to evaluate Y. And this is actually enshrined in the language itself. If the first thing here is false, followed by an and, it will not do this. It will not do that function call at all. That function call will not get called. So, uh, and, and this is a very common construction where you say if pointer and doing something with the pointer, the very common, very common idiom, because otherwise you have to have your check for it being null. And then after that, do something with it. And so this, what you see here with it, check to see if the pointer is not null and calling a function or something like that. It's very, very common. You'll see this in C++ also. And the reason why this works this code would crash or maybe not crash. It might play the Macarena, who knows, it's undefined behavior. While this would crash or otherwise do undefined behavior if stir was null, this will never be called. This this function call, will it will not even call the function if stir is null. Yep, so. So if we just have this, it'll print foo called and hello world, right? So when you get to the if statement, it calls the function, the function prints out foo called, returns true, so then it prints out hello world. Now if we did this, if false ended with foo, what is this, what is our program overall going to call now?
going to print false? What is it going to print to the screen? Yeah, nothing. It never even calls foo. See that? Okay, so what is what is this code going to do? Yeah, if you have a false anded with the rest of the if statement, it never it doesn't even look at it, it doesn't even call. It skips right over it. So what about this? What is this going to print on the screen? Foo called and hello world, just hello world, just foo called or nothing? There, love the Foo Fighters now. Nothing? Perhaps you guys did not see that I changed that from an AND to an OR. It will not print true to the screen. It will not print false to the screen. Nowhere in here do I have a COUT statement that is printing either true or false. There's only two printout statements. There's Foo Fighters and Hello World. And so there's four possibilities. Foo Fighters is print, Hello World's print, both are print, neither are print. Okay. Votes are in. It's going to just print Foo Fighters. And the reason for that is because uh, you can't do short circuit evaluation if you have an OR and a false. Because false or with anything is just the other thing. So you have to know what the other thing is to know if hello world is going to get executed or not. Now if we did true or with foo, only the coup fighters, the scout fighters, what is this going to print? We gotta vote for nothing. We gotta vote for our only hello world. Foo Fighters and hello world. Are you guys learning something today? Just hello world. Are you guys learning? Are you guys having fun? Learning more about if statements. Yeah, it's it's a it's a um, a lot of people think of short circuit evaluation as just an optimization technique, because if you have x and y and z and and if x is false, you don't need to look at all their. Other. So a lot of people just think of it as like it's an optimization that you don't really need to know about, but in reality, um, it's a very common construction to do both a check for a null pointer and using the null pointer at the same time. That's, and, and that leans on the fact that short circuit evaluation is actually an official rule of the language itself. So this code here, because it is true, uh, it does not need to see what the result of foo is. It doesn't need to. And if this was a purely functional language, you wouldn't even notice the difference. A purely functional, a, a purely functional language has no side effects from a function. C++, however, allows side effects. In this case, the side effect is printing Foo Fighters to the screen. And so you do notice a difference here uh, if short circuit evaluation is turned on or off based on whether or not Foo Fighters will occur. Uh, but in a purely functional language, you, could actually, you would actually have no idea of knowing if uh, it was doing short circuit evaluation or not. Because uh, in, in a functional language, all you can do is pass things to a function and get values back from a function. You can't do side effects. You can't do anything that has a side effect like C outing or writing to a database and, and things like that. So what are functional languages good for? Absolutely nothing. They actually, <laughs> side effects are actually what <laughs> uh, make programs useful, like write to a database. 
that's a side effect, you know. Uh, there's, a, you know, a lot of things you can do with a, like a pure mathematical function. Take x, return 2 times x. And that enables all sorts of very interesting code. But side effects kind of make the world go round. And so um, most of the research on functional languages, in my opinion, are just figuring out ways on how to get them to be useful without compromising their ideals or whatever. Okay, what was the stuff people used to make default parameters? Um, default parameters looks like this. So we give it a parameter and set it its default value to zero. This is actually very useful for refactoring code. So I've got, let's say I've got this function foo here. It's used a thousand times through my code base and I want to add a parameter to it. If you just add a new parameter and give it a default value that makes sense, then all your old code works, you know? So this is a very common and useful approach to refactoring your code without breaking your code base. You just add functionality to it as long as you don't delete a parameter or something. It's just fine. Um, so um, some people don't like uh, default parameters, by the way. There's this guy, Arthur Dwyer, who... Uh, runs a user group for C++ in the very end. He, he hates default parameters for some reason. All right, let's take a look. Any, anyone else want me to look at their code? Or now let me shut off the rest of my code here so you can understand what's going on. Um, so, uh, let's see. Let's see. Okay, so I gave default parameters here to avoid having to declare variables, I'm doing a pointer like that uh, instead of an, um, instead of uh, a vector. <coughs> and I'm initializing it to null. All right. So by default, R is going to be a null pointer. And then I use an if statement, same trick that Crunty uses to initialize A to be the index of the start of the array, B to be the index of the midpoint of the array, and the array being new. I, I'm actually allocating and deallocating memory dynamically without memory leaking. Um, uh, R equals new unsigned integer one plus end minus start. So it's going to allocate just the right amount of memory for us and does so all of this without using a, a semicolon because the variable is actually declared here in the parameter list. Then, yeah, so this does the... Uh, splitting, dividing in half, dividing in half, dividing in half, and then this is the zipper merge. So it figures out the beginning, but uh, this is like Corrente's pointer to the beginning of L and the beginning of R. And then this, uh, instead of clear, he uses vector clear. Instead, I am um, allocating a new temporary array. And then the zipper merge is basically the same as his code. While A is less than mid one or B is less than end, then if this is, I'm very proud of this line of code I wrote here. Um, if array i plus plus equals, so it's gonna, so it starts off with i equal to zero, right? It's declared up here in the parameter list of the function. Um, true or true is true. Yeah. So I declared i up here as zero. So it's going to write into the first element of R. It's going to write into R0, and then I increments itself. And the value that it writes in is, well, if A is less than B, then it writes in A. If uh, B is greater than A, it writes in B. The correct pointer increments, so it grabs the, grabs the value from the respective arrays and incre in increments the pointer, essentially. And then once either of these hit the end, then it um, will copy the rest of them in. No, no, no. Yeah, that's all actually part of the, the same loop here. So if A is less than the end and B is less than the end or A is less than B. Yeah, so basically it's gonna, it's gonna do the zipper merge and pick up all the elements at the end all in one line using a ternary operator and three um, uh, sequence point violations. <laughs> you, re you really shouldn't have multiple plus pluses on the same line uh, for good reasons. 
So, um, and then after all that's done, the array has the zipper merged data in it, and it's going to copy it back into the vector. So it splits it in half. So this call here sorts the left half. This call sorts the right half. Uh, this allocates a new temporary array. It writes into the temporary array. Uh, it does a zippered merge, all with zero lines of semicolons. And then uh, I'm actually quite proud of this uh, nonsense here as well. So while i is greater than zero, it's going to copy. It actually copies backwards because um, you can't say start plus plus plus. But you can say start minus minus uh, plus minus minus. So so vector starting at the start plus minus minus i. So it actually starts at the end and goes backwards like this. And it copies uh, the values the values over. And if i ever hits zero, then it deletes the array and we're done. So this this is a hell of a line right here. I spent probably an hour writing that. Uh, that monstrosity right there. And it's wrapped in an if statement, so there's no semicolon. So, uh, yeah, start plus minus minus i. Yeah. Yeah, so. Fec. Square bracket start. It's the beginning of the, yeah, the beginning of the array. And it's going to decrement i, because i is one too high right now. So it pre-decrements i. If i hit zero, then it uh, deletes the array and puts uh, the value in there. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. It it copies it copies the it copies the zeroth element out, deletes the array, and then returns that copy that value into vec start plus minus minus i. So by and large, it's just going to be copying array i into vector i. But um, when it gets to the last element, it copies the last element out, deletes the array, and returns that value with no no lines of semicolons. Is mid and yeah, mid is declared up here. So these are just the midpoints of the array. So they're halfway between start and end. Yeah. So this is. Uh, it, it also doesn't work under the current compiler version because uh, there's a sequence point violation and you have too many of these things. So I could probably fix it um, using the if using the if trick. Um, I could just split these out and have them um, just have them be on their own lines. So I, I, I could actually fix that without costing me any semicolons. I just haven't bothered yet. Okay, uh, isn't pragma checking to see if it's defined? No, uh, pragma, uh, what pragma means is a uh, compiler directive. So you, you've probably seen pragma before in terms of hashtag pragma once, right? Have, have you, is that, is that the place you've seen uh, pragma before? Yeah, so that's a very common thing that we, we do with um, header files is the, the very first line of your header file, you say hashtag pragma once, and that's a better, people will argue about, um, but it's a better replacement for the header, your typical header guards, right? So normally when you have a header file, you have to have like, if def, blah, you know, then define, blah, you know, and then at the very bottom of the code, you have to say hashtag end if, and if you screw up any of those lines, then uh, everything breaks. Um, I, I'm not a fan of that because you have to come up with a. You have to come up with a new blah, and 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 there's you know standard like read you know h, you know. But like, what if you use a library and they have a file with the same name and they use the same convention? Now your header file magically doesn't work, right? Because their header guard de define is the same as your header guard define, and and a lot of people just name them after the file. And there's nothing stopping them from having a read.h, and you have a read.h, and now when you include your read.h, nothing gets included because it's been defined. Uh, the header, and and so, like people will will say that pragma once is is terrible, but that's all you have to do. All you have to do is put hashtag pragma once, and let the compiler keep track of which header files have been included already, because you don't want to include the same header file multiple times, right? Like if if um, if you do this. 
uh, what happens is the compiler will detect um, if they use pragma once. It'll detect you've included it once already, and then it doesn't include it a second time. Pragma once is very nice like that. And, and probably the standard library uses header guards because the reason why pragma once is quote unquote bad is because it's actually not part of the C++ standard. It's just a thing that every major compiler supports. And, um, and so if you use it, you're using non-standard C++. You know what they, you, you know, though, if every compiler supports it, it's standard. Like, I'm just going to throw the one out there. Like, it's not like there's zero chance that G++ or Clang or Intel's compiler or MSVC is going to remove support for Pragma once or change how it works. Cause it's literally a standard. It's just a de facto standard instead of a de jure standard. And it's a better technological solution than using header guards because you can get a namespace conflict. And if you and it's and that's a bizarre bug, by the way. When you include your when you include one of your files and it just doesn't work invisibly, it doesn't tell you. It just invisibly doesn't work. That is a hell of a thing to debug. And uh, Pragma once is just a technologically better solution, hundred percent. The only downside is it's not technically standard, but Uh, how does it know if there's two different read.h's? Yeah, so let me show you. So public read.h in my read library. So I have if def, and then I just made up some um, some things. So if if in def, so if not defined, so if this symbol here is not defined, then we define it. And uh, normally you might see define as like defining it as like something like that. So you can use that as like an alias, like you could cache tag define uh, T to be true. And then you could uh, use T instead of true if you really wanted to screw with people and stuff like that. Uh, that's usually what hashtag define is for. But you just define something with no parameter to it. And that just means that symbol exists. And so the if def and if in def uh, say, does this symbol exist? Ha has this symbol been defined by the preprocessor? And so if we have never defined underscore, underscore, read, underscore, shock UVM, underscore H before, then we define it. Now, the next time somebody tries to include this header file, then it the, the symbol has been defined and it will do absolutely nothing because the matching part of this if statement is at the very bottom of the code and we have an end if down here. And the end if, uh, so basically the preprocessor will skip all of that. If, uh, if we if we did something like include it multiple times and and usually you don't directly include it multiple times but like io stream includes string and a lot of people include string separately from io stream right it's actually considered good practice to do this because technically there's no guarantee that io stream will include string for you or if it does include it it doesn't necessarily include the whole thing and so bjarni recommends you do this if you want to use strings you should include it separately from IO stream. Now, if you include string and IO stream includes string, now you've included it twice. And so, um, let me show you what happened. If, let me show you what happened if you don't use include guards. Include bob.h, okay? So vim bob.h class bob int x, okay? So if we compile our code, works fine, right? This has been included once. Now if we include it twice, we get a redefinition error. You can only define a class once. And so in order to avoid this problem of, you know, because a lot of times you include something and then that'll include something or you include this other thing and that includes something. Like, you know how many times CMath gets included, you know what I mean? And so to avoid this problem, we uh, can say pragma once. Hey, it works fine, it works great. It's a better technological solution than saying if and def underscore underscore bob underscore underscore eh, whatever, you know. If, if and def, what am I doing wrong here? Uh, yeah, okay. 
There. Yep. So you have to do three lines of code instead of one. So you, you, you might notice that I have strong opinions on this. I'm also in the minority. Like most professors will tell you to do it this way. This is the proper way. Uh, the only thing is I have actually seen this bug happen in the past where two people use the same um, the same random symbol and that's not documented anywhere. It's not published anywhere. It's completely invisible to the programmer. If two people just happen to come up with the same you know, symbol to use for their header guard, then the second header file will just not include and it will not appear and you include it and just nothing happens and you can't use any of the functions from it. You're just like, what the hell is going on? And it is garbage. It is absolute garbage when that happens. It is a mystifying and puzzling thing. So personally, um, yeah, pragma once and just call it a day because they're not gonna, nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna take that away from you. Okay. All right. Uh, is composition something to help pr prevent redefinitions? Like if you find Bob is class Bob, if you forward declare it as just class Bob, then yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, you can, you can declare something as many times as you want. You can only define it once. There is something in C++ called the one definition rule. A, a function can only be defined once. And, uh, this causes problems, right? If you have, um, if you have a function, like my read function here, uh, and multiple .cc files include read.h, then each one of those .cc files has their own copy of read. So um, it's a problem because uh, because each one thinks it has the definition of read. Um, and so the way you solve that is by adding the inline keyword uh, in a header file. So very commonly in a header file, uh, inline, it's already 1050, whatever. I, I hope you guys are learning stuff because this is actually kind of important C++ stuff. Like if you make your own header files, like you have to use header guards and stuff like that. Like it's pretty, pretty important. Like that's literally how the world turns. Um, So let's just take a look at some random header file and there you go. You can see they have header guards on it, right? Like this is standard practice, you know? And then they also have stuff like this. Like if uh, this version is over something and if this is not defined and um, define this and that and the other thing. And so yeah, all this header file stuff is all very common. Um, so if you, yeah, so the problem is, here, let me move main.cc, then a.h. Uh, and okay, so there you go. World's most simple function, return 42, it returns 42. Okay. I, I haven't explained what inline does. I'll, I'll explain it in a second. So. Do you guys do you guys agree that this this is a function? Is this a definition or declaration? Yeah, Cheryl's right. It's a, it's a definition. So if I said int return forty two. People always get these confused because they both start with the de sound, which, and in the, in kin, right? I hate it when they have competing terms like this that sound, start and end with the same letters because the way that the brain works is we look at those to try and figure out the same length, the same beginning, same ending characters. Um, it's just confusing. So I kind of wish they'd come up with a different um, terminology for it. So you can have as many declarations as you want, but you can only have one definition. You guys understand? Okay. So 
we got here a.h. Okay, so let's vim a.cc and we will just see out uh, return 42. And we're going to include a.h. You guys with me? No, you don't like that. Okay. So, you guys with me so far? going to print to the screen. Forty-two, cool. All right, so I, I I concur. This will print forty-two to the screen if we file this. Still haven't explained. Okay, it's a dot cc. Sorry. Um, it's forty-two. Yeah. Still haven't explained why inline is important. Okay, now check this out. Let's say that you've got multiple .cc files in your project. And you've got another one, then b.cc, and b.cc is, uh, I don't know, return 420, and it's gonna return 42 times 10. So what do we, what do we need to include in order to get uh, return 42 to exist. Now, the ending bracket was irrelevant to this question. Um, yeah, we have to include a.h, right? So we've got a function here that is calling return 42, and we've got, so we've got a.cc and b.cc, and they're both including the same, the same thing. So the first thing we need to do here, you know, is we'll just slap a pragma once on top of this, and then g plus plus dash c a dot cc. Uh, uh, here, uh, let's let's have it call you. So is this a declaration or a definition? Yeah, it's a declaration. Okay, and notice how this compiles now, right? If we didn't have this, if we didn't have this, this line won't compile because C++ has to be told what goes into a function before you can use it. In this case, we need to know the function name, the parameter list, and the return type. We don't have to know, we don't actually have to know the, the parameter names. You can actually, you know, do that or something like that, right? To, uh, you don't actually have to give it a name. Okay, so here we go. So if we just tried G++ and A.CC, we're gonna get a linker error. Okay. So, so this function is in A.H, right? So it's, it, it, there's a definition. So if all we had was this a.cc file here, we've got a definition for 42. Do we have a definition for 420? If we just g++ a.cc, do we have a function definition? Do we actually have the body, the function body for uh, 420 blaze it? Nope, we don't. We only have the declaration, right. And so what happens is it'll actually compile. If you uh, say G++ dash C, that's the compilation step. It compiles just fine. And if you look at the, uh, uh, what it compiles into, um, this is all of, uh, mm -hmm. let's turn off address sanitizer and stuff like that. And I know. Um, you can see here that it has, in its body, in its the text segment is the the code segment. It's got code for return forty two. However, return four twenty is undefined. Right? There's no function definition, so it's trying to call it, and there's assembly code in there to call it to call four twenty, but it's undefined currently. So if you try to build an executable out of this, G plus plus eight 
then it says, uh, sorry, I, 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 I'm unable to find the function called return 420. So, g++-c b.cc, right? b.cc is the one that has our, our function in it, right? And let's turn off address sanitizer on that one too. nm b.o, and you can see that this is a very simple function or a very simple .o file. It uh, has a definition it's going to cause us problems in a second. It's got a definition for return 42, and it's got a definition for 420. Okay. So, in order to resolve the linking the linking problem, when we say g plus plus uh, you can't build an executable because it's missing this thing right there. So, in order to link it, we say g plus plus a and b dot But now we got a different problem. And the different problem we have is that there is a definition for that function in a.o, and there's a definition for that function in b.o. Both of them think I have the I have the official definition of return 42 inside of me. Okay. You guys understand how that came about? Like what if I didn't even do that? What if I just said uh, and return 42, return 43? What if I did this? Do you see what the problem is? So a.cc has one version of return 42. We've got a different version of return 42 and both of them think I'm the real one. You're the doppelganger, I'm the real return 42. Do you, do you see how do you see how this violates the one definition rule? The one definition rule is like a function can be defined once, and both main.cc or a.cc and b.cc both think I've got the original, I've got the original function, and in this case they actually disagree, which is quite bad, right? Uh, in reality, though, most of the time you're going to get violations of the ODR from including the same header file in two different cc files. Because what happens, what happens when you include? What, is, what does that do? What does hashtag include actually do behind the scenes? Do you guys know? They copy paste. Yeah, very good. So it literally like goes uh, edit a.h. It just sits there and it just copies this code. Boop. And pastes it here. That's, that's literally what it does. It just literally copies and pastes it. And so a.cc has that, b.cc has that. Both of them think I'm the original return 42. Hopefully they're the same. They might not be. They might not be. Hopefully they're the same. But it doesn't matter. It won't compile. It won't link because it's violating the, the one definition rule. Okay. So you get this here. This is a linker error. Linker errors are not nearly as nice to look at as compiler errors. Uh, so in function return 42, there is a multiple definition of return 42. So a.o from file a.cc, uh, defined it there. And then in b.o, we've got another function here. Both of them think that they are the real boy. Will it still compile if the functions are overloaded? Yes, it will not compile. <laughs> it will, if, uh, if the functions are, are different prototypes, then they will, it will work fine. But this problem that I'm talking about here, this problem comes about when two different .cc files include the same header file. So the primo once, primo once helps when a .cc file includes a header file multiple times. usually through different headers, including the same common headers. But it doesn't help if two .cc files include the same definition. So one approach you can take is just to not have any definitions in your headers. 
If all you have in your header file are declarations, it works fine. I don't really like that. I actually like having everything in a header file because then I don't have to keep track of a header file and a .cc file. Um, it's actually easier in a lot of cases. It makes compilation simpler. It makes sharing your file simpler. Read.h, everything's in read.h. Here you go. Get, get clone, read.h, boom, you've got my read lib. That's it. No installation necessary. No make files necessary. You just include the header file and it's just, it's the easiest way to, to do things. So how do we fix this? Inline. G plus plus a dot cc b dot cc works fine. And so you can see now that rather than it being um, a definition, a T, remember it was in the text segment before? Remember what it used to be? It was uh, not whatever it was, it, it, there was a T there before. Um, it looked like that. Now, because I marked it as inline, it is W. W stands for a weak reference rather than a strong reference. And so a weak reference can be multiply defined. Okay, so solution. Everything that's in a class, everything that's within the curly braces of a class declaration are automatically inline. Everything that's templated, I believe, is automatically inlined as well. So, um, Believe if we did this template uh, sorry. undefined because we never actually template it yeah but um all right the, the correct the correct thing is to, to inline it okay if, if it's pretty sure if you template it you don't need to inline it and if it's uh if it's inside of a class if it's within the curly braces of a class you don't need to inline it but for just global functions you put into header files you have to put an inline there to solve this problem so you don't violate the odr Okay. If you make a header file someday, remember the selection. Uh, so what does it actually do when the code runs? It works exactly the way that you think. When you call return 42, it returns 42. Now, what if you violate the, like what if, uh, what if you, what if you compile a.cc you change the header file and compile main dot, uh, b dot cc. Now you're into undefined territory because inline, like when you have a weak reference like that, you're, you're, you're promising that every copy of it that has the same name is the same function. And if you update the header file and you don't do a, a clean remake, then everything breaks or not. It'll maybe it'll just use one of the two. I don't know. So, um, yeah. So inline, a lot of people think inline, um, like it, it used to, it used to mean like, um, optimize this function away. So rather than making a function call, uh, just literally put the number 42 where the function was. That, that's what inline originally meant. So rather than, because every, every time you call a function, there's like a little bit of overhead. You have to push things onto a stack and move the stack pointer down and all this kind of stuff. And if it's something really simple like this, then the compiler literally could just replace 
they could literally just replace return 42 with, you know, like 42. That's called inline function. Right. But nowadays, the optimizer will do that for you. So inline nowadays basically means um, um, make it a weak reference. It's more or less the, the main point of inline these days. You guys understand there's a little bit of C++ trivia, but it's important C++ trivia. Okay. A is cool. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a 15-minute uh, break, and we will continue with recursion when we get back. It's good. I mean, honestly, it's it's actually pretty important C++ stuff. And this kind of stuff with linking and stuff like that, we, we do talk about more in 45. So don't, don't feel bad about not knowing it. It's more fourth semester stuff than third semester, but the question came up, so I'll answer it. All right, scene 15. All right, and we are back. So um, I, I wouldn't worry too much about this stuff, um, but if you do see linker errors, it is kind of sometimes one of the more annoying uh, things to, to deal with. All right, um, so we're gonna continue our discussion of recursion now. And um, again, you have a recursion extra credit due on Thursday. Hope you make up some of the points. All right, so recursion, recursion, recursion. All right. So we'll talk about proof by induction later, but um, one of the um, um, one uh, the induction or uh, yeah recursion can be used in a lot of different ways in, in in sort of interesting fashions, right? So one question, uh, one fairly famous problem you can solve using recursion is is this one uh, given trominoes that are shaped like uh, l pieces like this where it's it's like a domino but there's three tiles instead of two if you're given a power of two sized square so the dimensions are 2 4 8 16 32 by 32 etc and you removed exactly one of them is it possible to tile it using trominoes what do you think? I mean, I'll tell you it's possible, but how, how on earth would you go about like proving that using the powers of recursion? What do you think? Cause like if I, if I were to give you an eight by eight grid like this and handed you a stack of trominoes and one square is off limits, you can't use, uh, would you be able to you know, place them on, place them on the board in such a way that they tile properly? How on earth do you prove that? Any thoughts? It is possible. How on earth do you prove that? How do you write an algorithm to do it? Go. Okay. Hmm. How do you make an algorithm to make a maze? Do you think you can make a recursive algorithm that would generate a maze? Recurse with a non-valid square for the base case. Yeah. Um, the base case would be like a two by two with one square missing. And for that one, the base case is just placing the tromino on the thing, right? And then what's the inductive step? What's the... What's the, what's the next step? So if, if I could give you a two by two square that has a square missing, could you use that to solve, uh, 
a four by four square with one square missing. Do you understand what I'm getting at? If the number of tiles is divisible by three, is it? Will the number of tiles be divisible by three? You have a power two size, all right? So like, let's say you've got a, uh, a eight by eight, right? The size has to be power of two, right? So there's 64 total tiles, you take one out. And so you have 63 remaining, it's divisible by three. Is that true for all numbers? If you take um, four by four, 16, take one tile away, you get 15 tiles, divisible by three. So that, that itself could be a proof. You know, that if you take a square of a power of two and subtract one from it, you get a number divisible by three. So how do you, how do you do this? If I, if I gave you, if I told you that this uh, two by two base condition, right, um, was solvable. How could you prove that this works for the next step where you have a four by four? How could you use this fact Maybe one of these is taken out. How can you use the fact that this is solvable to prove that this is solvable? Because you got four quadrants, sure, but only one of them is missing a square. Uh, it is seven by seven, isn't it? Interesting. Uh, either way. So, uh, how do you how do you do this? Because, you know, if all three of these were missing squares, it'd be quite easy, right? You'd just say, well, you just use the that to, you know, solve a form, but it's not. A 4 by 4 is 4 by 2 by 2s. It should have the same properties. It doesn't. Because this 2 by 2 is missing a tile. Like, this one has one of the tiles cut out of it. And these do not. So you cannot just say, well, it's just twice as big. Do you, do you see what the problem is here? Like it's not immediately obvious how you can prove that a four by four is solvable from a two by two because um, one of the two by twos will have a tile missing and three of them won't. Do you see that, Harry? So what's the missing step? There's a very brilliant move we can make here. Whenever you do proof by uh, induction, which is what we're going to be talking about today in recursive proofs and recursive algorithms, do you, do you remember what I said earlier about the self-similarity principle? Uh, if I find my mouse, yeah. So the self... The self-similarity principle. And that's when the sub-problem looks like the super problem. So we, we kind of want this big problem here to kind of look like the smaller problem. So how do we do that? What, what move could we make? Remember, we're trying to tile, we're trying to tile this four by four grid that has one square somewhere within it missing with traumas. How can we get these three because this section is missing one. How can we get each one of these three sections to be missing exactly one square? Let's make it self-similar. If we could have, uh, if we could have four two by two zones and each are missing a tile, then we know that it's tileable because we know that it, any two by two missing a, missing a single square is tileable by a traumata, right? So what, what move could we make to, to take one square out <coughs> of the three, uh, these three, uh, where's my mouse? These three chunks here. Anyone see the move that we should make? Take out the three squares which connect. Yeah. So we place a trauma note here. You see that? Trauma is a little L-shaped triangle. Uh, domino 
we place it right over the corner, like that. Voila! Now, each of the sub problems, each of these, uh, if I could have my thing line up properly, each of these two by two zones are now a sub problem that matches our base condition. Do you see that? And so now we know the four by four is tileable. Okay. Do you see that? And what if uh, what if we want to prove that eight by eight is tileable? Uh, well, an eight by eight is a a four by four, a four by four, a four by four, and a four by four. And one of these is going to be missing a square somewhere within them. PowerPoint will let PowerPoint will let me draw it. Seriously, dude. So if we have four four by four regions and one of them is missing a tile, we know this one is tileable. We know that we know how to cover this one here. Seriously. Um, we know that this one's tileable because we just proved that for any four by four with one missing tile, we can tile it. <clears throat> but how do we tile these that are not missing any squares? How can we make them resemble this one? What's our approach? Do the same thing? Yeah. We do the same thing. We place a single tromino over the intersection right here. And now the uh, each of these each of these four by four zones is each missing exactly one tile somewhere within them. And because we know we can tile any four by four zone missing one tile, this eight by eight zone is tileable. Okay, now that we know that eight by eights are every Every possible eight by eight missing a single tile is tileable. Uh, how do we prove that a 16 by 16 is tileable? A 16 by 16 is a set of four eight by eights, right? Eight by eight, I can draw. Eight by eight, eight by eight. One of these is gonna be missing a tile somewhere. How can we prove that this one is tileable? <clears throat> Yeah, it's the exact same thing. It's it's recursion, right? And so you have a base condition, which is the two by two. And then for the inductive step, um, basically um, you just say given um, four quadrants, one of which is missing a tile, three of which are not, um, you place a single tromino right on the corner of the three. Now they're all missing one tile. And because we know the sub problem of a four by four, whatever, that's missing one tile is tileable, this new thing is tileable. And so that is called a proof by induction. This proves that for all boards of size power of two squared that are missing exactly one tile somewhere within them, that you can you can tile them with trominos. It's kind of cool, right? Kind of cool. You see that? So as long as you have the um, the piece over the corner, then uh, it's tileable, and then it recurses down like that. Okay, so let's, with that sort of graphical introduction to, uh, you see this? So the white the white is the square that's missing, and so there are programs that will do this tromino tiling for you. But so like, you see how it's divided into like a 2x2 two two region and a 4x4 four four region and an 8x8 eight eight region. So the 2x2 two two region missing the square is just a single tromino over the other three. And then the 2x2 uh, two two region here that's missing a square um, it, pl it places the L-shaped piece over the corners. 
So now each of these is a two by two missing one square and they tile those. Then for the eight by eight, it places a L-shaped piece over the corner. Now it just tiles these the same way that you understand. So <clears throat> there's websites that'll do that for you. So no matter where you put the uh, the square, you can um, you can sort of tile them around it. Looks like your rug. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about yeah proof by proof by induction. So. Um, how many people here have seen proof by induction before in like pre-calc or something like that? Like it's usually kind of touched on like briefly in like 11th grade or something like that. Um, it's actually really important to computer science and in computer science, we do for better or worse, a lot of mathematical proofs. You're going to take a series of theoretical computer science classes, discrete math being your first one. And um, only in the Zy books, yeah. Well, we're going to go over it today. So, for example, prove that the sum of all numbers from 1 to n is equal to n squared plus n divided by 2. And uh, this looks like algebra, right? It looks like math. But it's actually crucially important to computer science because in computer science, recursion is um, an important thing. And if you can prove that your code is correct for a base case, and you can prove that the inductive step is correct, then you have proven that it is correct for all input. You know, right up until you stack overflow or integer overflow or, or something, right? So let's say we want to prove this. And so even though it looks like we're doing algebra, what we're really doing is training our brains to think about problems systematically and to not write bugs and things like that. So, <clears throat> Um, what you do when you do a proof by induction <clears throat> is you prove that the base case is, is true and then you prove the inductive step is true. And there's kind of a, a bunch of different ways of stating this. There's different ways of thinking about it. But um, <clears throat> basically the way that I think about it is um, prove that it's true for the base case like n equals 1 or whatever, whatever the smallest thing is. In this case uh, one, right? N equals one. So prove that it's true for one. So, uh, the sum of all numbers from one to one is, is one, right? So on the right hand side, one times one plus one is two is two quantity two divided by two is one base case is proven. Do you guys need me to write that down? Or do you guys concur that if you substitute one for N, you get one on the left hand side and you get one on the right hand side. You guys agree? Or do you need me to Type one times two divided by two. Oh. Okay. Um, so the base case is true. Now, how do you prove the inductive step? This is the, the base case is very easy. <laughs> like for most of these proofs, uh, the base case is just like, all right, just put one in there and see if it adds up. Because if the base case is wrong, then it's just it's just wrong. You just stop there. It's very uh, the, proving the base case is usually the trivial part. It's the inductive step that things get a little tricky. And so for the inductive step, uh, the way that I usually think of it, and there's three different ways you can think about this, but the way that makes sense for me is assume that this is true for n. Assume that, you know, it's true for, you know, n numbers. And now you need to prove that it's true for n plus 1. And if you can do that, if you can prove that the inductive step is true, and you've proven the base condition is true when n is 1, then you have proven it is true for all possible natural numbers. Do you see that? Because if the base case is 1, and so if you prove that it's true for any n, it's true for n plus 1, then proving it's true for 1 proves that it's true for 2. And proving it's true for 2 proves it's true for 3. And proving it's true for 3 proves it's true for 4. And so on and so forth. So that's kind of how I like to think about it. Sometimes you'll see people... Do the proof the other way, assume that it's true for n minus 1 and prove it's true for n. It's the same thing, just, you know, whether you add 1 or minus 1, you know, it's a more or less the same thing. Um, another way of doing it is uh, assume that it's true for all numbers from 1 to n, and that's what's called strong induction, and it it, it all basically works out the same way. Um, so how, how would we go about doing this one? How 
I just threw my tablet down too. Pick it back up. So how do we do this? How do we? How would we prove the inductive step? That's this is the this is the key takeaway from today. Can you pick a random number as in? Nope, you can't. And a lot of students try that. Can't do that. You can't just be like, I'm going to prove it's true for 100 and show that it's true for 101 and have a proof. Nope. You have to prove it's true for all n. And that's the uh, that's the tricky bit. So um, so let's just copy this over to one note. Paste. So this is what we're trying to prove. Prove this. All right. So for the base case, pretty simple. Base case n is equal to 1. So prove that 1 is equal to quantity 1 times 2 divided by 2, which is equal to 1. So, yep. Base case checks out. All right, cool. And then now we need to prove the inductive step. <clears throat> the inductive step. So the way that I like to think of it is, I, I say this to myself, assume the uh, thing is true for n, prove it is true for n plus 1. That's that's my goal. Okay. Graph function, see if it's contiguous. Yeah, it still doesn't help. Like, even if you proved it's true for the first 10, it could be wrong for the 11th one. You have to show that if it's true for n, it must be true for n plus 1. And so, uh, if we were to type this out, just copy this, I don't have to write it here. So, so we're trying to prove So assume this, prove this. You guys see that? So it's just a uh, plus, you know, plus n plus n plus one. So this is this is you know everything we had before. And then we just added one more term onto it. We added, you know, n plus one onto that there. And then in here becomes n plus one, n plus one, n plus two, or n plus one plus one. Yeah. You guys see that? So, you know, it's like if if you've proven it's true for one through four, prove it's true for five. So one plus two plus three plus four plus five. I feel like that's not valid for all cases. Yeah, if you assume this to be true and you can prove this is true, you have proven it for all cases. Because if uh, be because you have the base condition proven, so if it was true for one hundred and you then you've proven it to be true for one hundred and one, and if you've proven it true to be true for one hundred and one, you've proven it true to be one hundred and two. For all natural numbers, it is correct. Doesn't work for negative numbers. Anything below the base case, obviously, straight out. So, how do we do it? Well, in algebra, we like to sort of like uh, group things and substitute things and stuff like that, right? So for the inductive steps, for any problem, we do n plus 1 after we prove the base case. Yeah, so you pr first prove the base case, which is trivial, usually. And then you assume whatever it is you're trying to be proving is true. You assume it to be true. And then you prove it to be true for n, the next element in the series. Right, so in this case, the series is the summation of all numbers from one to n. So the next number in the series is the summation of all numbers from one to n plus one. And then you substitute in n plus one for n here, n plus one for n here, and there you go. So we have to prove this to be true. So how do we, how do we do this? There's a dot, dot, dot in here, right? And dot, dot, dots are freaking annoying, right? Like, you know, like, that's not algebra. That's just a dot, dot, dot. Like, you got to get rid of it. Anytime you see, like, a dot, 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 
like an in, it's an infinite possibly number like how do we get rid of it well um let's make the observation and this is the key thing here this is what you're going to be doing over and over again when you uh, are doing proof by induction is you note that you know what that is what is the sum of all numbers from 1 to n do we know what that is n it's not n what is the sum of all numbers from 1 to n 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10 all the way up to plus n not in no, no, it's it, it's right here. It's right here. We we know what it is. It's this, right? It, it, it's our assumption, and so uh, all we do is we take this part here and substitute it in here. That's it. That gets rid of that annoying ellipse. Okay, and then after that, it's just algebra. So. Our next step would be n times n plus 1, quantity divided by 2, plus n plus 1 equals that. Substitute. That's that's the key observation, this thing here. You you need it's the self-similarity principle. You you state your new problem in terms of an old problem. And since you know how to solve the old problem, because we're assuming it to be true, it feels like magic, assume it to be true. And the only reason why this works is because when you go all the way back down to the base condition, we know the base condition is true. And so if the base condition is true and you prove it, if it's true for n, it's true for n plus one, you've proven it for, for literally everything. So when you're doing the inductive step proof, all you do is you assume it's true for n and you prove it's true for n plus one. Okay, and now at this point we just do algebra, so, um, uh, goodness, this, this is always easier to do on a whiteboard than on, uh, than on a computer. Um, so we got n times n plus, one. okay, so this is going to be like n squared, n squared plus n quantity divided by 2 plus n plus 1 equals, and then we're going to foil this thing out, it's n squared plus 3n plus 3n plus 2, one over by 2, let's multiply everything by 2, we get n, get rid of parentheses now, n squared plus n plus n plus 1 equals n squared plus 3n plus 2. Uh, did I screw that up? Uh, did I screw that up? This one. Oh, because I didn't multiply this by 2. Yep, 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 yep. n plus 2. There we go. Um, and then, uh, then we have n squared plus 3n plus 2 equals n, n squared plus 3n plus 2. Check. You guys see that? So, the, uh, the key move, the, every, all this stuff is just algebra. And, you know, if you've taken eighth grade algebra, you can do the thing. But the, the key thing to get rid of the infinite series is to note that we know what the sum of all numbers from 1 to n is. It's n times n plus 1 divided by 2. That's it. Swap that in, then you just algebra your way out of it. Hopefully you don't screw up like I just did there. Like I said, it's easier to do on a whiteboard because you, you sit there and mark it. Um, so... That's it. Now we have proven it to be true. Um, so yeah, so the way you do an uh, inductive proof is you first prove the base condition, 
for whatever the smallest value you allow. And then you take the leap of faith. So it feels very weird. It feels very weird to say, well, we know, like it feels weird to say, well, we know what that is. It's that. Well, no, we don't. We're proving that, aren't we? Aren't we proving that right now? You know, um, it, and that, and that feels like a, like magic. It feels like black magic sometimes. Like, um, wait, how, we, we don't actually know that we're proving it. Huh? Well, you know, we're assuming it's true for N. That's the key thing. We assume it's true for N and we can use that because we're, it's an assumption. We assume it's true for N. We're trying to prove it for N plus one. And that's called the leap of faith. It feels like a shaky foundation, except it's not because the base condition is proved. That's, that's what stops it from being just an unfounded, you know, thing is that if it's true for the base condition and you true, if you've proven it and, and if you've proven it's true for N, then it's true for N plus one, then proving it's true for one proves it's true for two and proving it's true for two proves it's true for three. It's not possible for it to be wrong at that point. So, um, uh, there's lots and lots of inductive proofs. Uh, there's people who specialize in this. Uh, stuff. Um, yeah, so the trauma no pu puzzle, the base condition, prove the base condition, it's proving the two by two. And then for the inductive step, it's it's a geometrical proof. Like you have to somehow get the, the inductive step in a form that matches what you have already. And the, and the key observation there is to place a tile over the corner like that. And now you've got, now you've got four quadrants, each of which are missing exactly one tile of the smaller size. So, uh, prove it's true for the base condition, the two by two done. And then after that, prove the, prove that if you're given an N by N square missing one tile, that's tile will prove that you can tile two times N times two times N. And you do that with the key step of that. Now that one, that one, that quadrant, that quadrant, that quadrant, and that quadrant, are all missing exactly one tile. And we know that a quadrant of that size, whatever it is, n is tileable. If it's missing a tile, then we've done it. That's it, that's whole proof. Uh, Towers of Hanoi. So um, have you guys ever heard of Towers of Hanoi before? It's a kid's puzzle. Um, I think there's a meme the other day. Uh, None of these memes are very good. I did see one the other day that was, that was pretty good. Oh, I'll try to find it for you. Um, so, Towers of Hanoi is a... Uh, I'm probably immediately going to have to pick up my tablet, my... Uh, <laughs> my Wacom again. Uh, Towers of Hanoi is a kid's game where you can move one disc at a time and your goal is to transfer the entire tower of discs from one spindle to the next. And the rule is you cannot ever have a bigger disc on top of a smaller disc. So for example, I could move the small disc to here and then the second disc to here and the small disc on top of it there. And then I'd have the third disc here exposed. The third disc could go here. The small disc could go here. The second disc could go here. The first disc can go here. And now I've got a pile of three and the fourth disc is exposed. Then I put the fourth disc here, and whatever moves I use to move the third disc, I move it on top of there. Now the fifth disc is exposed. I put the fifth disc here. Whatever whatever set of moves I use to move the four the four discs, I put that on top. So now I got one through five here. Then I move the sixth disc here. Whatever moves I use to move one through five, I put on top here. And so it's a recursive. There's a recursive solution. Okay, you're you're moving. There you go. There you go. There you go. Yeah, that's that's the one I saw the other day. Yeah, so. <laughs> Uh, so do you, do you understand what I'm getting at? Like, uh, let's say, let's say you had to move the, uh, the 50th disc, uh, and, but you know how to move 49 discs from one spindle to the next. So let's say somehow leap of faith, you knew how to move 49 discs from this spindle to this spindle. Well, how would you move 50 discs? Well, you take the 50th, you'd move 49 from here to here. You take the 50th disc and put it here and then move whatever it is you know, because you know how to do it, to move 49 discs. 
you move the 49 discs on top of it, and now you've moved 50 discs. So base condition, can you move one disc? <laughs> do, you, do you guys think you'd be able to, to prove the base condition is true? That you can, you can move a single disc? A, a si the, the single disc Towers of Annoy problem is quite easy. <laughs> You're handed three, three poles with a single disc. Can you move this from one pole to, the, to another? Yes. Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> Perhaps. Uh, and then, so that's the base case, proven. And then for the inductive step, you just say, assume that you can move in disks. Prove that you can move in plus one disks. Do you guys understand? So, okay. Well... If I need to move n plus one disks, I move n disks to, to one pole. I move the next, next disk to the third pole, and then I take the stack of n disks and move it on top. Whatever moves that took. I'm just assuming I've got a move list to move in in disks. Done. Can you move back to the original tower? Yeah. 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 You have to. Yeah. You, you have to make use of all three poles. But the only rule is you can't have a bigger disc on top of a smaller disc. Yeah, you're going to have to make use of all three poles. Yeah. So does that proof make sense to you? So base condition, move the disc. Done. Assume it's true for n, prove it's true for n plus 1. All right, well. Use whatever moves it takes to move in from one disc to the next disc. Then you move the next, the, the next, the n plus one disc over, and then you move the size n on top. Okay. Not very helpful. Okay. So, question is, what is the running time of this? Feels like an exponential algorithm, yeah. So every time you uh, go one disk deeper, you have to do twice the work of before, because you have to do all in moves plus one, and then in moves. So for every extra disk you add to it, the amount of work doubles plus one, but the plus one almost doesn't matter. So this is an order two to the n algorithm. So uh, the the original story for Towers of Hanoi is that um, a, a, a temple in Hanoi has these giant pillars, and every second a monk moves makes one of the moves, and they've got a stack of I guess I don't know like sixty or seventy discs or something like that, and whenever they finish the game of Towers of Hanoi, the world will end. So how much time do we have left? I think that's kind of how it was originally phrased, maybe. I don't know. I'll probably look it up on Wikipedia. But uh, anyone want to take a crack at that? It's ballpark. How long would it take to move 64 disks if you make one move per second? That's not accurate there. That's a heck of a problem. <laughs> that is not, that's not legal. Okay. Um, Sixty-four discs, yeah. So it would take roughly 585 billion years to finish. So 42 times the age of the universe. Um, many variations on a legend. It's not a true story. You know, it's just, um, and there's lots of ways of solving it. Um, so, um, it's a pretty pretty famous recursive uh, solution, though. Okay, so we can express the running time of Towers of Annoy. Get more poles. Yeah, that, that makes it a lot faster too. Uh, probably. Um, 42. Yeah, nice. 
Um, so the running time of Towers of Hanoi can be expressed in something called a recurrence relation. So the running time of the problem size t is t is a function giving you the running time. Okay. And the running time of Towers of Hanoi for problem size n plus one is twice the work of Towers of Hanoi of size n plus one, because you have the one extra disk you have to move. And so this works out to big O two to the n power. But do you understand what I mean by the recurrence relationship here? So if you've got 10 disks, the running time is going to be twice the running time of nine disks because you got to move the nine disks to a pole and the plus one is for moving the 10th disk to the third pole. And then you've got to move the nine disks again. So you have to move the nine disks twice. So it's the running time at size 10 is twice the running time of size n plus one. Does that, does that make sense to you? Like I, I, I've never been a big fan of like, you know, punching in the face with math, but I think it's pretty, pretty understandable, right? Like the running time doubles each additional disc you add, double plus, plus one. Yeah. No. Like if the running time was a minute, then you add another disc, the time will be two minutes, basically. At another disc, the time will be four minutes. At another disc, the time will be eight minutes. Okay. And so this works out to an exponential algorithm, order two to the n. Um, so we'll talk about master theorem, I think, next time. So that's, we've kind of covered a lot today. Um, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll give you a fun recursive problem. So let's we'll do a little bit of lab time, just math lab time. I would like for you to come up with an algorithm just in your head, just sketch it out. You don't have to code it. Just sketch it out. I'm going to give you like, I don't know, 20 minutes to do it. I want you to come up with an algorithm that's provably correct. They can randomly generate a maze. Of size n times n. Where n is a power of 2. Let's just make it easy. I should probably hold my tablet straight, shouldn't I? Okay. Why does it double when there's three towers? Because you have to move, like, you can't just, like, pick up the stack of disks. You know what I mean? Like, you can't just be like, and I'm done. You have to move one disk at a time. And you can't just move, like, if you move the, the smallest disk, you can't put a bigger disk on top of it. So you can't just, like, bloop, 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 you know, no. So you have to move a disk at a time. And so if you have a solution for, like, 50 disks written down somewhere, the solution for 51 disks is this. You got a, a tower, a tower, a tower. You got you got 51 disks here. The solution to move 51 disks to here is you move 50 to here. You move the bottom one to here, and then you move 50 of them to here. So however long this takes, you do it twice. So the, the running time to solve 51 is however long it takes you to solve 50 plus the running time to solve 50 plus 1 to move the very bottom disk over. And so the running time to do 50, you, it's not 50 moves. It's going to be like 2 to the 50th. Because in order to move 50, you've got to move 49 and 1 and then 49. And to move 49, you have to move 48 and 1 and then 48. So uh, that's not a simple task to move 50 disks over. That's like two to the 50th moves. Ish. Minus, minus one or something. Okay, so I'm gonna give you guys till 1220. So come up with an algorithm that can generate a maze. Um, like you gotta start, just for simplicity, 
have the start be in the top left corner and the end be in the bottom right corner. Guarantee to me that there you can make a maze where there will be a route through it. There could be other routes as well. Which is guarantee to me that you can make an algorithm that will you know, and I don't want you to make just all open. That's pretty easy. I want you to, you know, fill it with walls and stuff like that randomly. But to guarantee that there is at least one route available. Okay. Begin. See if you can see if you can figure this out. All right, and we're back. So, uh, how would you make a maze recursively? So I would tell you how big your maze has to be. 120 by 120, 256 by 256. It's going to be some power of two. How could you make a maze that has a guaranteed route from start to finish? It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to, you know, do any curly cues or anything like that. It just has to have a route from start to finish and randomly populate the rest of the maze with uh, open, closed areas, you know, you probably fill it with lines or something. How would you do it? How would you do it recursively? First of all, what's the base condition? Let's say two by two. How can you prove that a route exists? How can you generate a maze where a route exists on a two by two maze? Top left is the start, bottom right is the end. Only one square is a wall. That's correct. So what problem does this look like? Yeah, the tromino, right? <laughs> start start with the tromino. The the tromino is essentially the route, you know, that you're going to take. Um Okay, so, cool, base condition, two by two, top left is start, bottom left is end. You put a square that's off limits in one of the two corners, the other one's open. There you go, you got a route. Now, given that there is uh, a route from the top left to the bottom right of uh, um, a n by n, 64 by 64, 120 by 120, it doesn't matter. Um, given a n by n that has a workable route somewhere from the top left to the bottom right corner, prove to me that you can do it from a 2 times n times 2 times n. So if you've got a 64 by 64 with a valid route in it, then prove to me that you can do a valid route on a 128 by 128. The inductive step. How? I'm going to pause the video until somebody responds. All right. So not not two to you can't you can't go directly from two by two. To 128 times 128, you you would have to say like given a 64 by 64 or something, you know. And when you do a proof, you don't actually use actual numbers; you just say n n times n. But it can help to make it concrete. So somewhere there is a route that runs between the top left and the bottom right corner on a 64 by 64 grid. Given that that is possible, prove to me that you can have some sort of route. And this isn't, well, you can always just make an empty maze, right? But, you know, this thing should generate walls and things like that. Um, that a route is possible from start up here to finish down here on a 128 times 128, like that. How can you prove that? Our base case 2 by 2 is true. Yeah, you just say one of them is a wall, and then the other starts here, ends here. There's a route. Done. 
two by two, check. So for a four by four, you need to prove that a four by four route is doable given a two by two that works. How? So we've got, we know we've taken the leap of faith. We know that we can generate a maze that has a guaranteed route from the top left corner of the 64 by 64 to the bottom right corner of the 64 by 64. We need to prove that a route is doable in the 128 by 128 case. Remember, we're generating a maze, so it's not like this is a hard problem. It's the, the hardest thing is actually just making the maze look interesting. You know? Since we proved x times x, we can assume n plus 1 times n plus 1 is also true. No, 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 he got that one backwards, Harry. You have to assume n, n times n. You, you, assume, you assume it is true for n times n, and then you need to prove it is true somehow that you can make a map that has a route on it from here to here on the n plus 1 size. So that's your task. That's whenever you do a proof by induction. That and, and again, sometimes people put it as like assume n minus one prove n works out the same way. So where you assume it's true for all from one to n works out the same way in, in practice. Wanna be the area and all the dimensions that go from sixty four to one twenty eight? It is a uh, yeah, sorry squared or whatever yeah okay. so if it, if it is true that a route is available for 64 by 64 prove that a route is available for 128 times 128 I will go ahead and pause it again good exactly this is actually exactly the same problem as the Tromino case. I did this deliberately. Uh, <laughs> no, there's no algebra here, Harry. Uh, this is this is a graphical or uh, geometric proof. So if so, imagine that you've got some maze here. It's got walls, you know. It's got some open areas. It doesn't really matter what's in it. All you know is that a route exists somewhere, somewhere along the lines from this corner to this corner. Now, it doesn't actually matter what's here particularly. It doesn't matter what's here particularly. But what we need is a route to exist from here to here. And so whatever algorithm we use to make a route from this to this on a 64 by 64, we do the same for this quadrant. So that's actually not a big deal. The only trouble is if we zoom in on this, on this intersection here, this spot here will be open. That's the old end zone. But we don't know what's here or here or here. And so uh, this is actually the exact same problem as the Tromino case because what you can do is just say, make sure that at least two of these, or all three of them if you want to be easy, uh, just make sure all three of these are open and then make this one the new start for this subproblem here. And then it'll be able to generate a route that way. And so you're going to make a route through the maze that goes from the top left to the bottom right of 164 by 64. You make the intersection open because if this is a wall and that's a wall, there's no route available. This, I'm assuming it's only cardinal directions, right? Um, so at least one of those has to be open. For simplicity, we'll just place a tromino over the corner. It's the exact same problem. And then because we know we can find a route from 64... Uh, on a 64 by 64 from the top left to the bottom right, whatever algorithm that was, we do it. And now there is a route from the top left corner to the bottom right corner on 128 by 128. So we assume that it's that a route is possible from a 64 by 64, and we, and we use that to prove that we can make a route on any maze of size 128 by 128, and so on and so forth. And since we can prove we can make a route on a the base condition and we can make it on any one bigger than this this algorithm which can fill literally the rest of the you know you could like flip a coin and, and fill it with like walls or open tiles you know in a case like this where or a case like this you can flip a coin and just fill fill one in with a wall and leave the other open like there's different ways you can implement it but basically what we just care about is that a route exists somewhere through the maze 
And it's always going to create a fairly boring route that's going to always move more or less diagonally down the world, but we can at least guarantee that a route exists. Okay. No, you don't have to code anything. It's just geometric. It's just ge ge geometric. Yeah. No, there's no, no algebra. It's just a geometric proof. It's just a geometric proof. So, um, it could be fun to, could be fun to code, but, um, I don't need to. There's just all sorts of um, really interesting things that you can do with recursion and, and things like that. Um, everyone who sounds probably coding the solution. <laughs> um, you can also use graph theory to make um, mazes. So you can basically um, have a node for a vertex for every intersection and then you can start pruning edges between them and when you prune them obviously a wall comes up between them right and you prune them until you disconnect the uh the start and the end and then you put it back and maybe prune some more you can do it just randomly randomly pruning connections and um then uh you know just do that for a while and then you'll end up with a with a maze so all right so that's it for today your uh, your task for Thursday for the X credit because a lot of you didn't do the Markov assignment is to do the three D maze solver. Don't um, don't uh, do the thing where you just sort of like throw up your hands. And you're like ah, I can't do it. Like last Thursday, I gave you a solution to solving the maze in, in the two D sense. It's a small modification from there to get it to work on a three D maze. It sounds complicated, but it's it's not couple more if statements and things like that so um, it's an easy way for you to pick up some free points in this class and then um, what's going to be due next Tuesday is a proof by induction worksheet so we'll do we'll do more proof by induction and uh, recurrence relations uh, we just barely touched on recurrence relations today but we're going to do more proof by induction on uh, Thursday and the worksheet will be due on uh, next Tuesday. Okay. I'll be part of your math homework section. All right. You guys understand? So, um, proof by induction. The key thing is this. Okay. The, the single greatest problem I see, in, in fact, what I'm going to do actually is just, I think I'm going to actually just have you do for the daily quiz, like one, proof by induction off that worksheet and just I, I want to see if because most like the the mistakes that people make for proof by induction is they just set it up wrong so they do the base case wrong rarely it's usually this thing here like they'll 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 assume it to be true for 10 and prove it to be true for 11 that doesn't work you have to assume it to be true for n and then prove it to be true for for n plus one and the, the key thing is this substitution step here Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna take. I'm I'm just gonna have you do a single one of those for Thursday. We'll go over that and just see, like, just see if you, because once you kind of get it organized in your head properly, then it's pretty easy. Like, it's not easy, but it, it's pretty straightforward. But a lot of students just have like a incomplete understanding of how proof by induction works. And it, it, it's pretty straightforward. You prove it's true for the base case. You prove it's true for the inductive step. It's proven true for everything. That's it. So, is there going to be an answer key for the worksheet? Nope, not at all. It's you turn it in, you get it right or you get it wrong. But on on Thursday we'll go over we'll go over a couple of the examples. So, hopefully there'll be enough answers for you to. Um, yeah, you just structure it. Yeah, you just prove the base case. That's usually pretty easy. And then for the inductive step, there's always going to be some substitution like this where you substitute in the old like you find you see here one plus like this matches this exactly right and so you you, you rephrase it you regroup it in such a way that it matches what you know to be true you substitute it in that and that gets rid of the annoying dot 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 that you can't deal with otherwise anytime you see a dot 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 you should focus in on that with laser-like intensity like all right 
I need there's a dot 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 up here. I need to I need to I need to rephrase this so it exactly matches this. And then once I exactly match this, I can substitute it. Okay. So that's our class for today. And uh, is there an answer key for the combinatorics worksheet? Uh, no. If you, have, if you have any questions, just ask me. But the next combinatorics uh, competence exam is now up, and that is due on Tuesday as well. All right. Peace out, you guys. I'll see you next time.